Is everyone good? Um, the reason we are holding a press conference is just to um, discuss what our intents are as far as investigating uh, this case for potential civil liabilities, um, as well as addressing some issues that we feel like the Tulsa Police Department has not addressed um, since the shooting. Um, with respect to the civil rights aspects of this case, we're looking at three uh, distinct issues, the first being equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Essentially, whether or not the Tulsa Police Department has been approaching African Americans in the community the same as they have Caucasians. Uh, there was a story that was uh, released, I believe it was last week, uh, by the Frontier uh, regarding uh, African Americans being four times more likely to have a use of force used against them by TPD. For some of the local press that have been here um, back in 2010, I believe there was a consent decree that was entered uh, requiring the police department to maintain records on use of force and encounters with African Americans. So we'll be requesting those records and using that information uh, in evaluating the equal protection claim. The uh, second uh, distinct cause of action that we're going to be looking at is obviously the excessive force claim which is a violation of the fourth amendment of the u.s constitution and to the extent that officer shelby violated it as well as whether or not the tulsa police department has had a systemic issue with respect to excessive use of force um, and then lastly the third issue that we're going to be evaluating is under the americans with disability act claim uh, title ii uh, regarding uh, public accommodation for individuals with mental health issues um, and we'll obviously go into more detail about those as time kind of unfolds. Uh, for the purposes of today, um, there were some issues that we wanted to ask TPD if they would be willing to discuss. One of the issues was that their online policies and procedure manual had been taken down over the weekend. Um, we were unable to access that. I learned as of a couple hours ago that that link has been reestablished so that people can access it. And I printed off a copy of their use uh, on mobile recording devices. And one of the things that we found interesting in those policies was that, uh, at least according to the policy which I've given you guys, there is under the MVRS use in subsection C, it indicates that every MVR, which is a mobile video recording device, is configured to begin with recording upon activation of a trigger any of the following triggers will begin recording. Subsection D of that provision states that by pressing the red button on the personal microphone module worn on the officer's duty belt or person can trigger the recording device in the vehicle. We've not seen video uh, from uh, Officer Shelby's vehicle and we don't know whether or not TPD consistent with their policy had Officer Shelby equipped with this red button uh, recording device that could have triggered the recording of her dash cam. We're asking the Tulsa Police Department to the extent that she did in fact trigger that device to produce the video from her vehicle. If she did not trigger that device, we're asking for TPD to make a public statement regarding why she did not. It's our understanding that she had uh, roughly two minutes to activate that switch. Um, and there's a long period of time that existed prior to um, the helicopter being present where uh, there's been statements made about what transpired. Um, and we'd ask that if the Tulsa Police Department does in fact have additional video that they've not released to go ahead and release that. And if they don't have additional video, why not? And do they admit that they were in violation of their policy? Um, the subsection 2 under that, and I'll just read it from their own policy, states, regardless of how the MVRS is triggered, officers are required to record all enforcement contacts and all custodial transports or detentions within the police vehicle. And so the primary purpose of us holding this presser today is to address that specific issue because um, while I would agree that the Tulsa Police Department has followed the law with respect to open records on the helicopter recordings, um, and the other recordings that they have uh, disclosed, um, they need to follow it with respect to all of the recordings to the extent that they exist. Um, I also want to, if you guys want to ask questions, I'm happy to field those questions. My client's not speaking today. She just buried her husband this morning. Um, she's got her friends and family here with her, but I'll happy to answer any questions that you guys might have.
Sure. I mean, what we're trying to get from the police department is any additional video footage, right? And also, I think that the Tulsa Police Department should release the helicopter dispatch, or not the dispatch, but the logs that would show why Officer Shelby's husband was in the helicopter that day, and whether or not that what, that was a common practice. Uh, did, did he uh, often patrol with her aerial while she was on the ground? And the logs will establish that. And this could have been purely coincidental. But it, it seemed odd to me from the outset that uh, he was in the, the helicopter while she was on ground patrol. Uh, Dan, my understanding is the police are saying that her camera wasn't activated because she never hit her emergency lights, which I'm not, I'm not clear on why she wouldn't have. But so, do you have any reason to believe that there is additional video that's not been released? Sure. Just sort of I do. Now, Russell, if you look at the policy, and I'll read that part of it, okay? There's multiple ways that the recording device can be triggered. One of the ways is by switching the activation into the second setting. But that's one of, I believe, five different ways to activate it. You can also just hit the front of the car with your hand to start the camera. Uh, if you'll look at the policy and procedure, um, let me see if I can get the specific. It's 31-202B, and it states, it lists a, B, C, D, and E are the, those are the ways that the video can be activated. The first is by pressing the on-screen button on the in-car mobile computer. The second is by pressing the red record button on the back of the primary in-car camera. The third way is by moving the emergency equipment switch to position two on the light siren control box. That's the question you're addressing. They publicly said the reason it wasn't recording was because she hadn't switched it into the position two but that's only one of five ways that they can trigger the recording device. The fourth is by pressing the red button on the personal microphone module worn on the officer's duty belt or person. That's what um, we're asking why she didn't do that or if she did, that would clearly start the video rolling and if there's video they need to produce that. And then the fifth way, and this is uh, the hitting the car, it says a sudden shock, bump, or collision with the vehicle will also trigger recording. And so I've provided a uh, print off of that uh, policy uh, so you guys can see that. But I think there needs to be some explanation beyond just that it wasn't in you know, switch number two as to why there's not video of the incident from her uh, dash cam. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're evaluating that claim in part as well. They have an obligation to, under the ADA, make accommodations for individuals in the community that have potential disabilities. That is inclusive of the audio issue that, that you're talking about, but also mental health issues and even drug addiction issues. Do you know who made the statement the I don't, and I think that the police department should release that. Um, we were involved in the Robert Bates, Eric Harris shooting. In that case, the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office uh, ultimately disclosed who had said fuck your breath um, and this to me is a similar type of situation in the sense that the department needs to explain whether or not or who, who made that statement and whether or not any disciplinary action is being taken. You asked for a special administrator. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that is and how important that is? Well, anytime, and this is a state law issue in Oklahoma, um, a special administrator of the estate is the person who the court appoints to investigate and to evaluate the potential for civil liability lawsuit. In this case, it's uh, Mr. Crutcher's wife, Frenchie Johnson, because they were husband and wife for 16 years. And so ultimately, she's been appointed to do that, and the courts approved our contract and hired us to evaluate that for her. I haven't delved too much into that, but I know that it's been some of the allegations that have been made, and, and we'll get into more of the medical side of it once we get the medical records. We requested medical records from IMSA, St. John's, and Tulsa Fire Department, and once we received those, we'll release them to the public.